Hi there, everyone. I'm here with Tim again. Tim's visiting me in England, and it's such an exciting time for me. It's actually making me lose my voice a bit, so I'm, so, so I'm sorry about my voice. But today we've come to Nottingham because I had to do some filming with someone who I film on a regular basis, Professor Phil Moriarty. We've just been making a video, but now we're in his office, and we thought, well, we're here. We're here with Phil. Why not have a chat? I mean, he's a physicist. He's a clever guy. He's going to have some good ideas. So we thought, why not make an unmade podcast with Phil? Are you up for this, Phil? I am totally up to, up for this, Brady. Thank you, Tim. Are you? Uh, do you mind? Are you feeling a bit jealous, Tim, or you know, having someone new on the show? I'm looking forward to it. Having someone else in the midst of our conversation, particularly because they're bringing their own ideas. So I'm I'm intrigued to see some sort of benchmarking, perhaps, for our ideas, and see where we stand when a physicist comes to play. Mm. Yeah, someone who's supposed to be really clever. Mm -hmm. Phil also has a book out. We're going to let him plug that towards the end of the show. So hang around for that. It's going to be really exciting. But before that, Phil, you're going to have to earn your keep. Yes, Brady. Yes. So you want some ideas for, for podcasts? Well, I thought I thought it's only fair perhaps we start by showing you how the experts do it. So I thought maybe I'll throw an idea out there just so you can see how it works and then we'll hear from you. And then to like get things back on the rails, Tim again will show you how it's done by an expert with one of his ideas. So Tim, you better start coming up with an idea now. And then we'll finish with one of yours as well. Are you ready? I'm ready. My idea for a podcast is inspired partly by you, Phil, because I wanted something that I feel like you, oh could, you could participate in. All right. So my idea for a podcast is called, Yes, That's Really My Name. <laughs> so every week you have a new guest come on the show who for some reason is often forced to say, Yes, that's my name. Yes, I've heard all the jokes before. And for people who haven't figured it out yet, I'm imagining, Phil, you are one of these people. I am indeed. And if you haven't heard of Sherlock Holmes, just stop listening to this now and go and read some Sherlock Holmes. But yes, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with uh, Sherlock Holmes' arch nemesis, Professor Moriarty. So yeah. So I'm a physicist rather than a mathematician. So I don't, have those, don't quite have that similarity. I actually had an Uncle James, though. I had an Uncle James Moriarty, so it's, it's Jim Moriarty in the, in, the, in the books. And I don't quite share his love of the binomial theorem. Other yeah. than that, in terms of the, you know, the, the evil genius aspect, absolutely, absolutely. So do you get this all the time? Do you always get Professor Moriarty? Like, is this something, obviously, obviously you're not going to get angry at people about it, but are you like good natured about it? Or how do you deal with it when people come up and give you the, oh, Professor Moriarty, ha ha. I'd like to hope that I'm fairly good natured about it. Yeah, it's, it's fun. It's something I play with. I even start off most of the talks I give, the lectures, just saying, right, we've got this elephant in the room. Let's head it off immediately at the pass. And if there are fans of Sherlock Holmes, they know what I'm talking about. So, yeah, it's, it's something to have a lot of fun with. There was quite some time, actually, with the students. I would say there was a good period of 10 years where students didn't really pick up on it because Sherlock Holmes wasn't on television, wasn't, you know, wasn't in the movies, etc. And then the TV series kicked off, the movies came, and then suddenly, yeah, it was picked up quite a lot. I think it's already obvious that this is going to be a good podcast idea because you can bring the person on, like like Phil would come on the show, you have a joke, funny stories, have you ever watched Sherlock Holmes, have you ever read Sherlock Holmes, you ask them all these questions that deal with that issue for maybe like the first 10, 15 minutes, but then it becomes a bit of a Desert Island Disc situation, Absolutely. tell me more about your life, tell me, do you know any other people I that do, have... I do, and in fact in Nottingham alone, Brady, we could probably do it just in Nottingham alone because there's a Dr. Watson and there's a Professor Snape here, so we can... There you you go. There, there's your first podcast sorted out. I have taken a picture of Professor Snape's door several times when I've walked past. <laughs> Tim, what are you thinking? Do you know anyone who could come on the show? No, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any famous Tim Hines out there? I don't know. Well, there was a time when I was working. This is more of a coincidence. It's not quite the same. I was. Um, my name is Tim Hine, and and I was working at a college called Tabor College, and I googled that one time and found an entirely different Tim Hine on the other side of the world working at an entirely different Tabor College, which is not quite the same thing because no one's heard of either of those Tim Hines or Tabor Colleges. <laughs> No. But it's a coincidence. But no, I mean, it's an obscure name, Hein. I generally get, I mean, everyone gets some sort of clarification comment with their name often. You know, if it's, they'll say, oh, is that German? And so I get a lot of, oh, is that German? I say, no, it's Dutch. And they go, oh, interesting. And if they are from either, you know, Holland or Germany, they'll say, well, how do you spell that? And so, you know, that's the little conversation that happens every now and then. But um, Brady, do you, do you get comments about your name? Brady is a a rarer name than Tim or Phil. I don't really get anything with Brady other than the Brady Bunch when like a new Brady Bunch film comes out or stuff like that. So, I mean, I went to school with a Michael Jackson 
and I'm imagining that is still like he, that follows him around everywhere he goes. Mm. But it's not just my podcast idea is not just for people with famous names. It could also be people with just names that cause like it could be like a rude word or like a word that's become zeitgeisty for some reason, like a name that's been co-opted. Like imagine some people have like a name that they've been fine with all their life and then something like really notorious happens, like some criminal or something happens to someone with that name and then for the rest of their life they're like, yes, that's my first name. and <laughs> Or, you know, I, I was born before that person so like my name wasn't stolen from that. So When I was a kid, you know, Heinz baked beans, yeah. you know. and But often I've, I've sort of judoed that and I use it to my advantage. Because when you're explaining your name to, in some situation where it has to be written down by some person filling out a form, I'll say it's um, Heinz food without the Z. And that just seems, oh, right, okay. And then they sort of smile and move on their way. That, they know how to spell Heinz, but they, um, they struggle with Hein. But a lot of this, Brady, is um, a lot of people have to clarify the spelling of their name or the pronunciation and they'll get clarifying comments and so forth. But the number of the idea is is more where there's something intriguing or related to it. Where's what's the what, why would you have someone on? I don't know. I just think I just think I like the idea of joining people with a common thread of something that's a bit whimsical and amusing. And I think like the idea of having a name that is funny and amuses people is amusing to everyone except probably the person with the name. Phil, if you could, like, somehow change something, like, do you think it's a blessing or a curse having the, the same name as this, like, you know, this famous villain? I'm very happy with it. It's a way of breaking the ice. I, I'm very, very happy with it. Yeah, I wouldn't change it. There's many, many things I'd change about myself before my name, so, yeah. I always didn't like my name when I was growing up, Brady, partly because partly because I just because it was unusual and no one likes being unusual when they're young. And also... Partly because of the Brady Bunch, so I felt, and I didn't like the Brady Bunch as a show, and I thought I was somehow going to be linked with it for life. So I always said when I was old enough, like when I turned eighteen, I was going to change my name to Jason, because I thought that was a really cool name. <laughs> uh, and then I turned eighteen, and by then I was, I don't know, I was, I was Brady then. I was, I was me. So my daughter's name is Saoirse. So Saoirse is the Irish for freedom. We really, um, my wife and I really, really like that name, and. Um, Having said that, it's not a very common name in UK. It's not particularly common in Ireland. And um, my daughter was telling me that when she goes into, you know, Starbucks or whatever and she wants to get a coffee, they always ask the name. And she says, Saoirse. And they go, sorry, what was that? She says, Saoirse. Cecil? No. Saoirse. Shoshe? No. Saoirse. How do you spell it? H-O-L-L-Y. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just because it's rather difficult to pronounce and spell. She'll be glad. She'll be glad one day. I'm glad I have an unusual name now. Why? Why, you, why, you, why do you like it? Is it, it? It feels mature and distinctive to have a name that's, um, that's only yours in a way. Is, is that what it is? Yeah, I don't imagine I would like going... I don't, you can tell me what this is like. You can probably both tell me what it's like. I don't, I don't like the idea of going into a room... And there are like, I imagine there have been times when you've gone into a room and there are like three other Tims and, you know, or you've been in a workplace where you're sitting next to another one. Or We've had four fills in the group, in the research group at the same time. That's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and it's not even the confusion that doesn't appeal to me. It's just the, I don't know. I like being different. I like being, I don't, you know, I like being distinctive. I don't like standing out, which is probably why I didn't like it at one point. And I still don't like standing out. But I also don't like being just another one. And sure. I'm not saying that everyone called Tim or Phil is just another one, but it's, you know, you know what I mean. It is funny when you meet someone else with your name, particularly when you're younger, but even now a little bit, because Tim, Timothy is not quite as common as a, I guess, John, we always think of John, John Smith and or as a very common name in, in Western places. But when you do hear it, someone in the meeting called Tim, you sort of have a slight, it's like a little bell goes off. Like there's a little connection, like, oh, Tim, oh, okay, well, probably get along with that guy or have something in common with that guy or there's some sort of connection that we have automatically like we're Tim's you know <laughs> to be fair I didn't think of that as like a, a comradeship yeah you're making me sad now that there aren't more Brady's in the world <laughs> <laughs> I would love to meet another Brady it would be amazing to meet another Brady if like I met someone in the Brady I'd get their photo I'd send it to you it would be a moment of great excitement <laughs> <laughs> Great Bradyness. I, I have met one or two now. I didn't meet my first other Brady until I was in my 20s at like a party or something. But just about six months ago, I met another Brady at a party and someone said, I said, can I use that charger, the phone charger in the wall? It was in Berkeley. And someone said, oh, you'll have to ask Brady. That's Brady's charger. And I was like, oh, there's a Brady here. And I was so excited. And I went up to someone saying, can you tell me where Brady is? And they said, yeah, that's her there. 
<laughs> and it was a and it was a lady. It was a lady named Brady. And that completely blew my mind. And like when I and I was like, I was so excited. Like I wanted to be her new best friend. I'm called Brady too. And I actually thought we were gonna become really close friends. I think she thought I was a bit weird and she kinda of gave me a bit of a white Backed bird. off slowly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're gonna get inundated probably with people sending you photos of Brady's. Oh, I would love that. If you're called Brady and you're listening please get in touch. Sometimes I do see Brady's on Twitter, like following me and that, and like, they're special, they're special. <laughs> and if you're a Tim and you'd like, <laughs> you'd like to contact me, <laughs> just, uh, just get onto Brady's Twitter line and pass along through those means. <laughs> so we're on board with this idea as a podcast? We are. What did I call it again? Yes, that's my real name. Well, today's sponsor is Audible with an unmatched selection of audiobooks and other audio products. Now, I'm a big Audible fan, each month using my credits to put new books on my phone. Great stuff for the gym, running, walking the dogs, or those long cross-country drives. I also like falling asleep to an audiobook sometimes. Now, as an Audible member, you get one free audiobook a month, exclusive sales, and 30% off regularly priced audiobooks. To start a 30-day trial, which will include your first book for free, go to audible.com slash unmade, or if you're in the US, text the code unmade to 500-500. Now, an audiobook recommendation. Well, later in this show, we're going to be talking to Phil about his book, When the Uncertainty Principle Goes to Eleven, which manages to explain the world of quantum physics with the help of analogies from the world of music, especially heavy metal music. And, well, guess what? It's available as an audiobook. It's not read by Phil himself, but by a fellow Irishman with a slightly posher accent. I can't tell you how much fun it is hearing the dulcet tones of the professional book reader tell me about the finer points of Motley Crue and White Snake. And I've also never heard the word tool pronounced so beautifully. But seriously, Phil's book is great. It's full of fun... Hardcore Physics and Fandom. I heartily recommend it as your first audiobook when you sign on for Audible's trial. It's audible.com slash unmade. Use that URL so they know you came from here. Or in the US, text the word unmade to 500 500. Our thanks to Audible for supporting this episode. Phil, it's over to you. This is the time. Step up to the microphone and tell us, what have you got? Thank you, Tim. So, yeah, so I was asked to do this at very, very short notice, but um, one idea that's been ah, sort of mulling over for quite some time, actually, not in the context of a podcast, but just as a general idea, but I think it might work as a podcast. Is, um, and actually, this is from my friend Laurie, who suggested this quite some time ago. An English major asks a physicist. So in terms of you'd have somebody with absolutely no background in physics, just asking physics questions. Right. So, you know, it could be the standard things like, why can you see through glass? Why is the sky blue? All the way up to what is this quantum physics stuff anyway? What the hell is an electron? Uh-huh. All that type of stuff. So let me oh, clarify, is this, a, is, is this, initially when you started talking, I thought this was like a comedy. In other words, they're asking silly questions and it's going to be a point of humour. Yeah. Or is it more sort of like a dummy's guide, like asking innocent questions that they're able to explain simple, simply? Don't see why it couldn't be both. Both of those would be really good. Yeah, in terms of the, I, I, initially it was a sort of, yeah, dummy's guide. But actually when you look at those dummy's guides, sometimes those, there is a dummy's guide to quantum physics, you know that? Oh, I imagine so, yeah. Which is, is you know, you went to Hilbert Space by Chapter 5. Now, I don't know what sort of dummies we're talking about, but that's, that's fairly complicated. Um, so, yeah, that type of thing. But also, yeah, unusual, quirky questions. The type of thing, you know, we've done to a certain extent with Brady with 60 Symbols, but actually extending that a little bit more and making it, you know, to somebody who has absolutely no background in science and maybe mightn't have a huge amount of interest in science at all, but see something, I don't know, they're cooking something and the pot behaves strangely or something or, you know, (laughs) anything along those lines, anything quirky every day. Might be fun. I think it'd be fun. Oh, that's a cool idea. There is a a radio show that's been going on for years on a... a, um public radio station in Australia, Triple J, called, kind of ask Dr. Carl. 
And, and so people call in and ask a scientist a question, all manner of questions. And, and also they lay out theories as well. Like they'll say mm. things to, like, does my beard seems to grow longer if I go to sleep at night by the next morning than if I stay up all night, I don't quite need to shave the next, you know what I mean? And he just sort of, I wish I could remember what he said about that now, but you know, it's those kinds of things. Is there any scientific basis for this? And The t-shirt I'm wearing at the moment is something called Pint of Science. So it's something that was in Nottingham uh, just a few months ago, but it's right across the world where scientists go into pubs and you talk about your research, you talk about various aspects. The types of question I get asked there or just compared to, you know, you go to a technical conference and you go to the other side of the world and you're talking about some aspect of your research and you get asked about the minutiae of the research as what's, you know, what voltage did you use or what current did you use or what did you measure here? You go to one of these pint of science things and it's like, why the hell are you doing that? Why should I care? It's that type of thing. That, that really no. type of general question is, yeah. That's great. That's, it's like lay questions and so forth. Do you, what do you, do you, there could be a strand of this podcast, I'm wondering, where people ask, like questions that sort of push the person beyond their knowledge like the why questions of life is that something you know what I mean like the metaphysical questions yeah uh, absolutely that would be good to do but I think the problem is sometimes you know for example I will get asked questions deep questions about string theory or deep questions about particle physics because there seems to be this like monolith that that's the physicist and the physicist knows everything about physics but in fact there are massive areas of physics that I'm as much I would say a novice in many ways as people who don't have a background in physics you know I'm not a I know a little bit about particle physics. I know a little bit about astronomy, a little bit about cosmology, but I'm certainly not an expert in those areas. So I think putting it, that could be nerve wracking in some ways, but could be quite fun. Yeah. There's a name for this kind of person. I'm trying to think, is it like the court, not quite the court jester, but isn't there a sort of a role in the court of the fool? That's what I'm thinking of. You know, the fool who says, but why? The person who points out that yeah. the emperor has no clothes or Absolutely. at least asks the question, why are we going to war with them? Yes. They have five times as many soldiers as we have. And you, you know what I mean? Asks the naive question yeah. that is has, has a that, that offers brilliance or and logic actually, to the room. That's wonderful if your premise is an, an English major asks. So you've got, you've got an idea from Shakespeare there that you're, yeah. you're pulling in. I've based a whole career on that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, do you see this podcast, if, if it was being made, as being best if it was the same English major every episode, the same physicist every episode, changing both every episode, changing only one of them every episode? Yeah, that's oh, what an interesting question. I think there's something to be said for having the same cast of characters. There could be a small number, I guess, of, of physicists and a small number of English majors. But actually, maybe even the same two people week in, week out, you, you grow sort of a connection with them. It might be interesting. Then you could ask for you know listeners to submit questions. That might be the best way to do it. There is a sense by which they'll learn as well like you say your base of career on this Brady but you come with a you know like a passion for the areas as well and you have over time developed you know incredible knowledge about it that's mean that's it's um developed whereas someone like myself like just today Phil we've walked into your office and I've looked at the blackboard that's here and there's all manner of notes and bits and pieces which quite obviously are related to physics and I've gone hmm that one looks familiar from Goodwill Hunting, and, <laughs> and it's you know tell me. But there is there is a show in that. It's me saying, "What's that? Tell me about that." And it turns out it was an entirely. Oh, Brady actually clarified, which proves my previous point. Clarified actually, that's an entirely different configuration or or you know mathematical or physical yeah. equation than um yeah. than the one in Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> What's on your board today? Yeah, Phil, do you? think maybe this idea, like not to take the idea too seriously, because I know you're just coming up with an idea for fun, but do you think this might play into something which I'm seeing more and more of, and maybe I'm just getting fatigued by it, or maybe I don't know if I like it or not, and that is the whole dumbing down of science, and everything every scientist does has to be put into a, can we explain this to dummies? Can we explain this to an English major? Like, make it make it simple. Like, there are physicists basing whole careers on this really complicated research, and it's now... It's almost like this thing isn't valid if it can't be explained to a dummy. Right. So let's 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 dissect and tease that out. First of all, let's 
let's not conflate dummy and English major. I think <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Physicists you, you, can you get, chose English major. <laughs> I did, I did, but physicists can get very snotty about that. It's interesting. There seems to be this perception in physics that, well, I can do triple integrals until the cows come home, and I can do this incredibly complicated maths. Therefore, I must be much brighter than everyone else. You turn to that person and say, well, okay, write me 500 words that are reasonably engaging, and they fail very badly. So it's about different aptitudes. So it's about, it's not so much the dummy aspect, it's somebody coming from a different perspective. That's what I'm trying to get at, that has no science. A bright, intelligent person, as a lot of English graduates are, asking you questions from a completely different perspective. You do somewhat something similar, Brady, when we do 60 Symbols, but you, you have got a passion for science. You've got a really interest in science. I'm interested in sort of going to somebody who might be vaguely interested in science, but have these burning questions, and they've, they've thought about them some time, but you know, don't, haven't had the opportunity really to, to discuss them at length. We've made a lot of videos together, and you've started, I guess, becoming more familiar with communicating science through video, which gives you the luxury of being able to use imagery. How much harder, easier or different do you think it would be having to get in front of a microphone with no body language, no diagrams, no equations, no graphs, no nothing people can look at? They're walking the dog, they're driving their car. Do you think you could do a good job explaining physics in that medium? What a brilliant question, Brady. God, this is why I like working with you. Um, that You know how much I swing my arms around and how much I die for a pen and you stopped me using equations a long time ago quite rightly I think that's a difficult chance but isn't that a wonderful challenge I'd love to attempt that yeah I'd love to attempt that but it's the problem is for me and Roger Bowley somebody who used to contribute to 60 Symbols a lot was a professor here he came to see the first maybe the first one or certainly the first couple of my undergraduate lectures to do peer review and he said to me the real issue here is you speak at the speed of thought and that's what I do the words come tumbling out and then I think about what I'm saying about five minutes later I'd have to really really change it's why I much prefer to write than speak because with writing I can edit and go back and read and edit and read and edit I'd have to really slow down and think about how I speak. But yeah, it's an interesting challenge. I think this is a pretty good idea. And I, I wonder actually if it could work as a dialogue, not necessarily asking questions back the other way, which would be another idea as well mm -hmm. um, as to why is this poem a wonderful poem? It's, you know, precisely <laughs> all, all, all those sorts of deconstructive and lenses and interpretation yeah, 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 that yeah. can go on. But um, also there is, there is an affect in science and physics as well, isn't there? Like you talk about a beautiful solution or an elegant solution mm. and you talk about particles and they're, I mean, they're images and they're diagrams and they could be works of art. You know what I mean? There's yeah. a, there's a, Absolutely. A way there's an which... aesthetic to it. There's an aesthetic. And that's exactly right. And there's an image that Brady knows very well. I think we've probably featured in, I don't know how many 60 symbols videos, five or six, which is what's called the quantum chorale, which is a ring of iron atoms. And you can see within that ring of iron atoms that are formed on a surface, you can see the electron waves. And I think many physicists, myself certainly included, have a real visceral reaction to that. It's like, wow, it's just, it's, you know, as, as a piece of art by itself, it's just incredible. Yeah. Guys, I've just had a brilliant idea for a podcast. No offense, Phil. <laughs> you inspired this. Imagine this as a podcast, right? A physicist explains their work to an English major. That Basically, sounds like my idea. That is your idea. Right? <laughs> that is your idea. And then that English major is taken into another room with someone else to oh. explain the physicist's work. Oh. And then that person has to go into another room ah. to explain. And you do it like 10 times. And, and then, then you look at the end. And then uh. play the podcast oh. back to back. Or just play the first one and the last one. Yeah. And, you, and then the final episode is like the 10th person in the queue coming back and sitting with the original physicist and explaining their work back to them Who? and see how much it's changed over the course of the 10 explanations. Perfect. Right, we're doing that. Yeah, okay, can we do that? Yeah. <laughs> also, not only could this be like wildly entertaining, this would be really like educational, informative about how... Ideas are transmitted. Yeah, yeah, and like how science is communicated and the problems with science communication. Clearly the scientists didn't explain this point well enough and you saw how it got misinterpreted. That would feed back really well to the physicists because they could think, oh, okay, so I thought I'd explain that well, but as I've watched it get twisted and mangled down the path and it could like say, I have to explain this in a new way. I'm really excited to see this. Yeah. I want to see this. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> So your idea isn't that they bring their own angle to it. It's not like they hear the idea from the physicist and then they say, oh, let me bring my humanities lens to that and talk about what's there. They've got to try and remember what they've heard and transmit it as accurately as they can. 
No, I think to a degree they are allowed to put it in their own words because that's what happens in society, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I watched a science documentary last night. Let me summarise it to you how I understood it. And maybe I'll weave in a few of my own analogies because that's what people do in life. They try to simplify it for their friends. And as you communicate something, you're always changing it and adapting it. You think you're improving it or simplifying it. Maybe you are. Maybe, maybe you're not. Maybe you're losing meaning. Maybe you're corrupting it completely. I don't know. Sometimes it might get to the other end and be fed back to the physicist and the physicist will go, that's brilliant. That's even better than how I explained it. Like, that could happen. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it will get polished and evolve as it goes down the chain yeah. or maybe it will go completely off the rails and get ruined. I'd, I'd love to see what would happen. Yeah. It could do either. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that, yeah definitely. Sorry, Phil. I just, I just completely... No, you, you, you took the seed of an idea and you ran with it. Good job. I once heard a child, just on this, I once heard a child describing this game as being uh, Chinese whiskers, <laughs> which I thought was perfect because they'd actually not heard <laughs> the name of the game accurately enough. <laughs> so even saying, let's play Chinese whiskers, <laughs> they, <laughs> they'd been playing Chinese whiskers. <laughs> Phil, I would say of all the disagreements and arguments we have of a friendly nature when we're filming together, I reckon 60 to 70% of them must be us arguing about what analogies are valid and work and what ones you're completely unwilling to, abse- Absolutely. to accept. Yeah, and we've just had an example of that earlier today, yeah. Where... No, that was me having a go at your analogy. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's, um, it's interesting what I'll forgive and what I won't forgive. And the one I really remember is entropy in messy rooms. Like we talked about that so much, the whole touching atoms thing. What I Actually, of all the 60 Symbols videos, that's probably, that's certainly one of my favourites in that it shows science as it should be, where me and you were discussing things and we're bouncing ideas of each other you won't accept you know what i'm saying you're wrong of course but that's that's okay <laughs> but what i really like is we bounce that back and forth and the, the 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 viewers of that really picked up on it yeah nice one i'm enjoying that good start good debut phil thank you brady you did well tim are Enjoying you ready this. are you ready tim i'm ready yeah no, that's that's strong stuff <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes, um, alarmingly strong idea there. And um, but anyway, look, my it actually has a similar theme in a sense of moving from one person's interpretation to another person's interpretation. My my idea is called friend of a friend, and it's built on the idea of taking, you know, the situation where you've got a friend and then you're going to introduce them to another friend and both of them know you really well but you're the 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 cog in the relationship if you like and so you've got to introduce them and but there's a little there's a few little ritual events that happen in this little scenario one is beforehand you'll be describing the other person so you know today we're going to meet phil and you know phil you know loves heavy metal music and he's a physicist and you know i'm you know, there's there's that sort of pre-conversation that goes on. Sometimes it happens more spontaneously where you're with the you bump into them. Oh, look, and and here's and that's traditionally when you forget your best friend's name in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then but you've got to kind of give them a little biographical summary, like you've got to sum up this entire person in a little bit of how you know them. So the podcast idea it explores this through showing it. You, you, I have on a friend and then, and then perhaps you've got to introduce that friend to another friend and you've got to describe them. And people can do that. And, and there's some level of conversation that goes on about accuracy and the way they're portrayed. And it's like, really, you see me like that, do you? Or something like that. So there's an idea in there. And maybe you want to refine it or find the, the physics within my idea, Phil, and correct it. <laughs> And then, he, and then you can explain it to Brady, who'll write a poem and take it to the person next door and on we'll go. <laughs> the thing you left out, though, is before you introduce your two friends, there's normally, like, warnings as well. Don't mention this. And, like, whatever you do, like, like you have to also <laughs> warn them, people, of, like, all the different landmines you can step on. Like, you can bring up anything, but whatever you do, don't mention this because it's a really sore point. I do like this idea from Tim, and it's kind of what we've been living out today, isn't it? Because I've known... Tim most of my life and I've been working with Phil for 10 years and bringing the two people together like and seeing what happens I think that could be quite interesting as a podcast format to like take I don't know who your host would be would your host be this same would it be a different trifecta each time or would there be like a common link each time I don't know I don't know exactly the nuts and bolts of how I would make a podcast like this work but I love the idea of it of bringing two people together and having this like common like fulcrum in the middle you could almost do a big brother type reality 
room thing where you go and talk about the person offline and then you present that when the person isn't in the room with you. And then you you have the reaction because you were talking about these are the things you don't say. Well, what if you did say those things? That's very nasty. Oh, oh. well, <laughs> there's an executive producer in you somewhere <laughs> for a television program. <laughs> there's a little bit. There's also the, the, the when the one of the friends like takes the initiative to do a bit of their own background research, mm-hmm. like like today when we met and we've not met before, and 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 you said, oh, you know, I had a look on on Twitter and you know what I mean, like yeah, that yeah, sort yeah, of thing, quickly yeah. to see you, and yeah. so there's a sense of how much can I glean from this person from the outside and yeah there's that sort of that's you know when the person's really preparing when they're doing the background research or finding out what they can phil i'm curious someone like you who moves in physics circles but i know you're also really into like you know heavy metal and that sort of stuff do you have like wildly different peer groups and when those peer groups mesh is that like a really happy time for you or a nervous time for you or do they never come together Actually, no. The, um, the the number of metal fans in the physics community is um, quite quite high. There's a, a real if you have a Venn diagram of physicists and heavy metal fans, it's there's quite a large amount of overlap. So actually, those two worlds come together. In fact, you know when I go to gigs, it's actually a lot of the time where my friend James uh, Theobald, who did his PhD here and is actually a physics teacher now, it's interesting. There's uh, even out there in terms of musicians there's a guy I know quite well a guy called Dave Fowler who's in the Australian Pink Floyd and he's got a he's worked with um, Sean Riley and Computer File a number of times and so he's got a lot of interests in the more scientific side of things I think there's a lot of links between musicians and scientists so for me those sort of it's not like there are very distinct friendship groups they all sort of blur into one Sorry for anybody who knows me and is friendly with me. <laughs> You're not just one big homogeneous mass. That is a funny thing about the different worlds that we have and whether our worlds meet, even our home world and our work world, but then different friendships and how they go. And, and the world you meet through your partner as well because they have all their friends and, and their different worlds and you've got to bring them together and, and you've got to kind of um, curate dinner parties out of you know a concoction of people <laughs> And pull them together and trying to seat people in a different place. Mm. And I guess all that happens at the wedding. Where do we put this person with that person? And well, yeah. they'll get along. No, they won't get along. And that's like a big boot camp in how our friends and their worlds are all going to match with your family and friends. Yeah. I guess my instinctive reaction to this idea when Tim first had it was, oh, this is really interesting. And in this, using us as an example, because we're the three people in the room, and I know Phil really well, and I know Tim well, and you two didn't know each other until before. So my instinct about thinking what would be interesting about this podcast was, oh, it would be so interesting for me to see how Tim gets along with Phil and what they think of each other and how they're different because I'm friends with them both, but they're from different backgrounds. But actually, perhaps the more interesting thing about this podcast, if it was put into practice, would be how do the two friends perceive the person in the middle? Absolutely. Like, like, like it would be, <laughs> Tim would be, oh, I see Brady purely as like a funny person who I have a laugh with and he's just a real, you know, figure of fun. And Phil might be, oh, I've always thought Brady was really serious and really intellectual and I've never really thought of him as a joker before. So, <laughs> Right, Brady, can you leave the room then for a few minutes? <laughs> so maybe that is what the podcast is. You choose your character, like a famous person, like a rock star or a just an interesting, an interesting person from the community, and then you pick two of the, their friends who are very close but have never met each other and bring them into the room and just see what unfolds with that dynamic of those three people. Because when you suggested that podcast, the first thing I thought was, I love the idea, but like, how are you choosing the people and what's like the, what's the format for the show? What's the criteria? Mm-hmm. Maybe that's it. It's like, today's guest is the Nobel Prize winning chemist, Bill Smith, who has, who's very prestigious and very interesting. And today we've got his childhood friend, Sandy, who they used to play in the sandpit together and spend Christmas together every year. And his colleague and co-Nobel Prize winner, John Jones. And, you, and once those three people are together, like, as they reminisce, you get a diff, you'll get a different perspective on your guest, who is, the, in fact, the focus of your show. Yeah, I think that works. But I, I would have the person, after they're introduced, introduce their friends. So you could start that way. You'd say, okay, oh, well, one friend here is Ben, and, well, I've known. Tell us how you know Ben. Well, Ben, I've – and I think that's a really interesting moment right there. You know, Ben is my – I've – and it's it's interesting for Ben to hear how he's summarised, you know, mm-hmm. and then it goes, and, you know, here's John as well, and John – 
Yeah, well, John, John is John. Hey, you know, they always have that moment yeah. <laughs> where you realise you've got nothing to say about this person at all. <laughs> they don't amount to anything except, good on John. Well, John's great. You know, and then you try and think of some facts. And John has a dog, you know. <laughs> but then but then I think you can move into, I think, what is yours, yours is a good idea. This is a, It's a really interesting little yeah. three-way conversation. But if I, I put my executive producer hat back on, more conflict. We need more conflict. That's sweet. If we really want this to be a hit, lots of conflict. Phil, if I was putting you on the show and you were like you were my guest, can you think of two friends who I would be best served to choose? Like, have you got two friends of yours who've never met each other who you think would be like good drama to see in the room together, and they would have different perspectives on you? And I'm imagining I'm imagining you'd want someone from like back in your island days and. Yeah, yeah, I can think of people. Do you really want me to name? Oh, no, no, no. Let's not get too personal here. <laughs> I can sort yeah, who have slightly different perspectives, but I don't know. I I don't know in terms of wearing different faces. I think the main issue I have is I wear my heart and my sleeve a bit too much, mm. rather than being, you know. There's not like Machiavellian. Th- I'm not smart enough to be Machiavellian like that. So yeah, I can actually I can imagine that being true. I don't imagine there were two or three different films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> Good idea. Nice idea, Tim. I would li- I would listen to that one. Phil. Yep. You got to have another one now. Have you got? Oh, you got- it's my turn again. Yeah, oh, you- that came around quick. You sure about that? Yeah, because okay. you have to do two. We're each okay. doing one, and you have to do two. Yeah, the other one I have. Well, there are a couple I could think of, but the one I really quite like is uh, you might have to help me flesh this out a little bit. Is um, when scientists go to seed. So sometimes when physicists and scientists sort of get to their... the, the Starring letter, Phil Moriarty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that happened a long time ago. Um, when scientists sort of get to their, their, their later years, sometimes they, they start exploring what might be called fringe science. You know, some of them might get into homeopathy or some wacky ideas about climate change, etc. And I think it'd be nice to, 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 to bring those people in and sort of interview them and see if you could try and find out where the hell it all went wrong. Just the really interested in the, the idea of somebody who's really prestigious, who's really made a name for themselves, and then have sort of lost a lot of that prestige, perhaps by exploring ideas where it's really, really at the fringe. So this is, this is something you've observed in the field... Is it? This is. It is. Yeah. There's there's a wonderful um, SNBC Saturday morning um, breakfast serial. For those of you who aren't familiar with that that web comic, if you're not, make yourselves familiar very quickly. But there's one about when a physicist, you know, reaches a certain age, and they start coming out with very wacky theories. So it's a, it's a well observed phenomenon. Phenomenon. It certainly happens quite a bit. Again, I'm loath to mention names, largely because of the libel cases. Um, but, yeah. Phil, just so I can kind of get a better understanding of this phenomenon. When a scientist goes to seed, as we jokingly call it, and they start getting getting into some more loopy ideas, are those ideas typically within their field of research? Like, could they have won the Nobel Prize in some niche area and then they start going in going weird in that area or is it normally they suddenly take an interest in something completely outside their domain and that's where they start getting a bit loopy what they try to tend to do in some cases at least is to um, link it back to their um, area of research so let's say they were quantum physicists what they then try and do is start talking about for example telekinesis and telepathy in terms of well there could be some quantum field that couples everybody together etc and then the problem is the real problem is is that they've got some authority from the, 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 the valid work they did that they bring to this nonsense. And then you find, you know, people uh, who don't know anything about quantum physics will say, well, he's an authority or she's an authority in quantum physics and they're saying this about telepathy or homeopathy or whatever. Well, maybe they could be right. That's where it starts to get a bit dangerous. So actually bringing them in, having a physicist or scientist in their field talk to them about this could be really quite interesting and actually helpful so your podcast idea is to actually have this person on the show as absolutely a guest. yeah yeah see it's all <laughs> about conflict <laughs> okay i don't know about that does it ever happen that they start doing their loopy stuff but they're on the, on the separate parallel track they're still doing their leading pioneering great stuff I, at the same time i can think of examples yeah i can certainly i'm, I'm not going to mention names, but i can certainly think of examples along that line and then the problem is the loopy stuff really then gets a lot of uh, traction because they can be really good scientists in one sphere and then 
thinking about things in a rather strange way in, in, in others. Yeah, I can certainly... There's two examples. Of it's okay. Isaac Newton's dead. You can't, <laughs> you, can't, well, you can't defame him. Newton's a great example in terms of the alchemy side of things, and he had very wacky ideas. Phil, I mean, you're still a young man with a lot of great science ahead of you, but do you ever worry... <laughs> do you ever see signs of this in yourself? Or do you ever worry this is going to happen to you? Do you need to... It, well, I guess what I'm asking, I'm not... In seriousness, actually, what I'm asking is... Is this a natural thing? Is it something you have to check in yourself that, you know, as you become so immersed in a topic, you do start seeing it everywhere. You start seeing quantum mechanics in the leaves of the tree and you can't help yourself and you've got to, like, have a discipline and say, no, 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 control yourself. <laughs> or is this just like a, a breakdown of the way things should be working? Um, oh, right. So I was 50 on Monday. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting on in years and the beard is greying long and tooth, etc. Do I try to see everything in the context of, you know, my area, which is nanoscience and quantum physics? God, I hope not. I really hope not. It does seem to happen to some individuals. It's not that prevalent, I would say. It's a relatively small population of the science, scientific community, I would say this happened to. So am I a bit worried that 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line, I'm start, going to start to lose it? Uh, I don't know. I'll probably lose it in many other ways first. So it's, it's, it's not that common, but also it's not that rare. Is maybe a little bit more common... The and I'm trying to think. I think there may be a correct term for this, but a uh, like a, a, a the blindness of knowledge in one field, or the confidence of knowledge is applied to other fields. In other words, because I'm I you know I'm a brain surgeon, I'm a great driver, and I know where we're going, and you know what I mean. I can navigate maps because Abs. and we, we use that a lot. And I think most people think huge intelligence and research in one area can you know well obviously they'll know how to do everything yeah but of course they don't yeah absolutely and again if i can bring it to quantum physics that happens a lot and we did, we've we did a video a while back brady was a, a, a doctor with a very stellar track record in sort of clinical research was spouting pure nonsense about quantum physics yeah that's interesting yeah and the, the, like i know nothing about this area and, and physics and like i said i walked in and looked at your <laughs> blackboard and was lost but there is a sense by which i know that uh, that means i'm easily blindsided by people who do have knowledge in this area like if if you were explaining to me about music or you're explaining to me about art or explaining to me on oh, music something you know much something about but let's say gardening or a range of other areas and then you were to to enthusiastically say saying well we know now at the at the quantum level there are all sorts of things mm -hmm. happening where we know this can happen time travel actually you know maybe mm -hmm. and i would be going well I'm, who am i to doubt you yeah. know what i mean like and there is so much of that Phil, I think you're going to have to change the name of this podcast if it's your intention to have the people as guests on the show. <laughs> yeah, we mightn't. Yeah, we mightn't get so many accepting the invitation when scientists go to seed. Yes, yeah. I, I can I, see I that. I would like pretty. you to come and be a guest on the show. <laughs> we think you have gone sufficiently to seed to be a guest on our show. <laughs> You're opening yourself up here for a line of attack, though, because people are going to be saying, well, look, well, Phil was such a, a fantastic physicist, um, and then he got into podcasting, and <laughs> just, he was just out of his depth. <laughs> I've already had some adventures yeah. on the web. <laughs> yeah, that's true, then you know, Tim. <laughs> so speaking of, speaking of physicists going outside their comfort zone and starting to spout weird and unusual theories, <laughs> Phil... Tell us about your book. Oh, thank you, Brady, uh, for that opportunity to plug a book. So it's it's a book called When the Uncertainty Principle Goes to Eleven, which Brady has now got his free copy of and he's holding up in the air. The back, I can read the back page, which right at the start, in terms of the blurb on the back, there are deep and meaningful links between quantum physics and heavy metal. No, really. And there, there really are. It's... Um, Heavy metal's music, obviously, some of you might doubt that, but really it is um, a form of music. And quantum physics is a theory of waves. So what's music? Well, it's all to do with sound waves and pressure waves, etc. So there are, those links are real, but with metal in particular, in terms of how you play the guitar, how you play the drums, in terms of the volume, in terms of the distortion, in terms of the feedback, all those types of things have analog and analogs and you can draw analogies with so many aspects of quantum mechanics. And not just analogies, you can draw real world mathematical connections between the physics, let's put it that way, of heavy metal and quantum physics. So it was a real fun time to, to write that book. Brady and I, I think maybe five years ago, threatened to do a video, which we never got round to, um, about the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle and its links to metal. And that's where the title of the book comes from, the When the Uncertainty Principle Goes to Eleven. What worries me, however, is that when I, I give this talk to schools, 
it's disappointing, but so many kids of sort of 18, 16 to 18, 20 year olds have not heard a spinal tap. Disappoints me. I'm looking at blank. Well, I'm looking Tim. That wasn't a blank face, was it? You, you've heard of Spinal Tap. So uh-huh. Spinal Tap is possibly my favourite ever movie. So obviously the, when the uncertainty principle goes to 11, the goes to 11 bit is ripped off straight off Spinal Tap. So I have been reading this book with, as, you, as you link quantum mechanics to heavy metal. I will say the three things I like about the book so far. I haven't read it all. One is it's very much written in your voice. And I actually, I'm not just like blowing smoke up your ass here, Phil. I actually like the way Phil writes. He writes a very sort of informal, chatty way. And I really enjoy, I enjoy reading that because it's like a conversation with you. Thank you, Brady. Checks in the post. All right. <laughs> The second thing I like is that you got all the artwork done by Pete McPartland, mm. who's a close friend of both of us. He's done illustrations, animations yeah. for my videos for a long time. Yeah, I think yeah. you probably met him through the work he's done on our videos. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm really pleased that... Yeah, he did a fantastic job. So when, when I was writing the book, I'd get really excited when I got the next round of illustrations in from Pete. And God, uh, sorry, Pete, if you're listening to this, for all the times I sort of contacted you at five to midnight and said, could you do this, please? He's, he's phenomenally talented artist yeah and the third thing i really like because it's so you and it actually makes for a quite a fun read it's like one of your problems when you when you talk to phil is that his brain's always going off on all these weird tangents and he'll like go off and talk about something else and then he'll be like oh but i must make this point i must tell you that and then he forgets what he was talking about and you've got to try and steer him back to the point and i imagine that makes it hard for phil to write a book because, you know, you've got to have a focus and a narrative. But Phil has gotten around this problem brilliantly with his use of footnotes. <laughs> yes. Because normally when you read a book, the footnotes are like the boring bits that you avoid. But with Phil, almost every page has got about eight footnotes on it, <laughs> filling the bottom of each page. And each one of those footnotes is like really entertaining as well. And like I actually enjoy the footnotes more than the book. I'm because so like, glad to hear you like you'll that. make some you'll make some passing reference to something and then there's a million jokes or other points you want to make about it. I can just feel you <laughs> bubbling with enthusiasm. Oh no no I've got to explain this. People must know more. And then you go off on go off on one in the footnotes. <laughs> it's like uh so the footnotes are my favourite thing in the book. I don't Thank know if that's you, common, but I love the footnotes. I, I, Half the book must be footnotes. It is. There's a there are a lot of footnotes, but I'm glad glad you said that. I was worried and I spoke to the editor actually I've got to say this the editor at Ben Bella I worked with two ed- uh, editors in particular and both of whom provided a huge amount of, of feedback to me what, what I found absolutely remarkable in writing this so I've written along with my colleagues quite a number of papers over the years for academic journals and a, a few book chapters as well this was a proper publisher with an academic publisher let's just put it this way deadlines will slide That Douglas Adams quote about deadlines, which is, I love deadlines, I love the whooshing sound they make as they go flying by. That's sort of my, you know, my mantra. But for this, I had to bring in the chapters on time and moreover the level of feedback was it was incredible it's you know move this you're not quite getting the right tone here it was like a tutorial or a workshop in creative writing for me so it was it was so good so thank you alexa thank you laurel so tim you've been skimming it for the last couple of minutes you've had it in your hand for the first time what's your early review this is a book that's good for me in a sense well i know nothing about um quantum physics but i i love music i i like some heavy metal there's been a time when i listened to lots and lots of heavy metal which bands and so forth well i I guess it's it's reasonably cl- classic. Hang on. This is actually one of the things I warned him about before meeting you. I said, don't talk about heavy metal too much. He'll really judge you by what bands you like. The great thing is we were driving past Donington at the time, and I was oh. like, I've heard of Donington because of the Monsters of, of Rock, Rock Festival. Yeah. yeah, And you referred to it as Donington, not Download. It's called Donington. So they changed the name of it to Download in 94, but it, anybody who's a true metal fan always refers to it as Donington. So. Oh, right. Well, well I done. Did, so you've I gone up even... <laughs> so many points, brownie points now. <laughs> I didn't know that but i know from you know the the, the acdc album yeah. the, the live album that was um recorded there and and so forth so yeah that's that's a classic so i love but i love reading rock biographies and so i'll read rock biographies of bands that i'm not even into and you know love so much i just have so many of them and they're just an absolute pleasure read so this for me is somewhere in between i'm i'm, I'm browsing it and liking it the, i like the footnotes too and i've just seen you're a big fan of rush huge yeah, but I love how band. you've mentioned how you're a big fan of Rush. And then you say that they've written so many great songs. And is it Neil? Is it Pert? Pert. Pert, Pert is it? Yeah. Neil Pert's? So yeah. that's um, hotly contested exactly how you pronounce that, but I'm pretty certain it's Neil Pert. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And um, he and then you say he's written so many classics. And then you say, and a few stinkers. stinkers. <laughs> and then you have a footnote which lists the stinkers. <laughs> 
that's that was I fun. Love, that's, the, that's the kind of academic rigor I like to see, that you're, you're not only mounting an argument and then giving a qualification and then you're footnoting and, and actually listing the, your evidence for the qualification. And I, I have to say, as, as, as an academic, I found that um, impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Neil. So there we go, people. Get on Amazon or wherever you buy your books from or bookshops or I don't know, wherever you get a book from, Philip Moriarty, Professor Moriarty to his friends. When the uncertainty principle goes to 11, asterisks, or how to explain quantum physics with heavy metal. (laughs) 